thank you everyone who is assembled here to talk about a very important subject and to those friends who have joined online. Greetings to all of you. I must admit that before this talk, I was treated to a sumptuous dinner, which may mean that for the first time in your lives, you will see that the speaker is falling asleep rather than the audience. <laughs> but indeed it is a privilege and an honor to speak about a human rights issue because the fruit and the gift of activism in this area will mean a better, more egalitarian and more humanist society. We are all African. Yes, we are. If you looked at your mitochondrial DNA, we also know that we are all from one single mother. All of us, big, small, tall, short, white, yellow, brown, whatever we are, we all have one common mother if we go back deep enough whether that is 300,000 years ago or 500,000 years ago, is a matter open for revision as we get more facts. But the unchangeable fact will be that we all have the same mitochondrial DNA, which means we are united in our origin. We are all African. However, some Africans decided to take a long walk, and so they did. Some of them came up to India about 70,000 years ago. And after a sojourn there, they started walking around again. And about 50,000 years ago, some dispersed to various parts of the world, and some came to Australia. There was another wave about 4,000 years ago as nature reports. And that wave has meant that about 10% of the genes of the aboriginals of Northern Australia are Indian. Talking of acknowledgement of country. Now, it is also a fact that most of the rest of the world, the genes are possibly from the Mongol army, but that's a different story. The fact is we are all united, we are all connected, and we have a common origin. We started African, but here we are with various national ethnic identities and colors of skin and shapes of skull and the kind of hair for those who have it. <laughs> now, those of you who would know the novel and things fall apart, Shinua Abe from Nigeria. Things fall apart is a story, is a story of, it's a complex story, but it's a story of something that happens in the Osu tribe in Igbo land of Nigeria. Who are these Osu? The Osu were those very precious, divine, pure beings, so pure, so precious that interaction with other humans could not be allowed because that would defile them. They were at the service of the devotion to gods. And therefore, the Osu were put in huts that were separate to the rest of the village. Over a few hundred years, the Osu were the ones who you could not touch and who could not touch anyone. They were the ones 
with who you could not have social interaction or any physical relation, even that of shaking a hand or of any kind of affection, far less more intimate things. The Osu are the untouchables of Nigeria. 2018, in a formal ceremony in Nigeria, they said, this is banned. We won't allow this anymore. Already 40 years prior to that, there was a law in Nigeria prohibiting and outlawing this practice of teaching, of treating people as untouchable. Not one single prosecution though in 40 years. And those who are born and belong to the Osu community would not tell you because that would immediately shame them and that would immediately kick them out of human society. Okay, leave the Nigerian Osu people animist in belief for the moment. Go to the, the Japan that we know of today, which is a long civilization. At least parts of its history could be called civilization. And go to that time a thousand years ago, the Tokugawa era. Around the time when even a foreigner visiting the island would be killed because the foreigner was not welcome. That was the time for several hundreds of years, the country was locked up. That was a real lockdown, believe me. No one was allowed in. No one was allowed out. But already by then, the Buddhists had gone there. It was then the favorite sport of the emperor to have eagles and hawks so that the emperor could hunt birds. Here came Buddhism and Buddhism said, don't kill unnecessarily. There was the emperor who had these birds of prey, which needed to be fed with good food, which is other birds. There was a moral dilemma of not, not continuing this hunting for birds. So the emperor stopped doing it. The emperor was very angry that there was a group of people who were actually culling birds, bringing them to feed the hawks so that the hawks could go and hunt other birds. This is wrong. Why are these people supplying food for the birds of prey? They are doing it wrong. Push them out of the village. If they are not part of the village, why should we even write their names down in the registry of the inhabitants of the village? And if we don't write these names down, should we even collect tax from them? In a few hundred years, those who are today called Burakumin, and there are a few of them still, became non-entities. No longer citizens and not even human, now not even visible. Okay. Go to Sweden of a thousand years ago. Or Spain and France of about 600 years ago. Let's be in French territory and look at what was happening with cargo. The cargoes were unclean. They were fit for working with rotten things. Anything unclean and filthy, they could handle. They could also do woodwork. 
So they should stay in the forest, not be in the city. Strangely, they should not even wear footwear. Uh, I'm sorry. They should wear footwear and never be barefoot because they might contaminate the land if they were going around barefoot. You could not be near anyone, far less eat with them or marry them. The kagos were treated like lepers. The justification for the treatment of kagos, you will have to go to the Bible, the Old Testament, to the story of Naaman, and to the story of interaction with Elisha. And it's a long story, but I'll just hint so that whoever is interested can go and trace the linkage. Unclean, leaper, not good for human interaction, therefore untouchable. They had to wait till the French Revolution, which the guillotine, the guillotine apart, was powered by ideas that were given by the humanists of liberty, equality, fraternity. How can there be fraternity amongst the, the humans if they were not slaves? Let us put that rider in. If they were treated untouchable. And there was reform of the law and support to them, specifically after the French Revolution, but there was a build up to this before. And they became assimilated. Now, when the Portuguese went to India as a colonial power, and they saw a system where certain groups of people were forced to wear a bowl which was hanging by their neck, and they were forced to tie a broom to their backs. And the reason for doing that was if you spoke, you belong to that category of people and you spoke and if spittle fell out, it should not defile mother earth by falling on it. And if you walked on the earth, mother earth, divine mother earth, then your feet might defile. Your footsteps might make it unclean for other humans. So the broom wiped away the traces of your presence of your walk. That's not enough. Never will you be allowed to come into the town before the sun was high up because if you came into the town, into the village, into human habitation, before the sun was high up, there would be a shadow cast and a long shadow might fall on a house and defile it. They, like the Cago of France, were eligible to do woodwork with which they made the churches in which their entrance was restricted, allowed but restricted. They who made the coffins, which they did not be eligible for, they were not eligible for, like them. The people that the Goans saw were allowed to carry dead bodies, clear the carcasses of animals, and do anything that is filthy, anything that has to do with body fluids. They were allowed, required, permitted to carry dead bodies and clean the filth of human, human excrement. They were born for that. 
when the Portuguese saw this, they used a word that they knew for it. And that was castas, caste. Caste is not uniquely Indian. By the time I brought you to India, to Goa, then not India. We already went to many countries where there was a hierarchy, a system of domination and subservience of human slavery built on the ideas of purity and defilement that you inherited. There was no escape from your fate. Being born into this category of people, every birth of that time was a death sentence. You could not aspire for anything else beyond perform the duties that were allocated to you by birth. The Portuguese were bad. They conducted the kind of atrocities that the Catholic Church was known for in that time. But they too were shocked to see what was happening in the areas that they were conquering. Many of the slaves that they encountered, the manumission of the slaves is recorded. Almost all of them who were liberated then from slavery belong to a part particular category in society. These were in fact, the ones outside the caste system, not even eligible for the caste system. What is the caste system then? It is what was confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, translated and named by a European of the 1800s as the song Celestial. Different people find different things in that. Today it is considered the guide for life for all Hindus. Silly Schopenhauer also thought that. But it is also the one work in which the Lord God, the avatar, confirms that humans have these four orders called Varna. And depending on which Varna you were born in, your station in life depends on that. And your privileges and obligations come from there. And mind you, says the Lord, when this order is disturbed, I shall come to restore it. What is this order? The order is that those who were born, presumably from the head of the Lord Creator, would be the priests, the gurus, the thinkers, the intellectuals. No doubt, for most period of time, also masters of the language of liturgy then, of ritualism then, Sanskrit. Then those who were born from the shoulders of the good Lord would be the ones who are enjoined to defend the nation, to defend a country. Now, something happened. Something happened to the recording, but it's probably oh, back. Yes, uh, it's probably back. Yeah. It's still recording. Oh, I have no clue. No. It is recording. Yes. 
So there was the warrior class, which was called upon to defend the land and assist the thinkers, the advisors, the intellectuals to keep the order. And there was a tradesman from the Thais and the peasantry, which came from the feet of Lord Brahma with four heads. I'm not sure from which head the Brahmins came, which is the first of the four. The peasants were the Shudras, which is the ones who came from the feet. And these were the artisans and the farmers and the ones who did the manual labor and so on. Those who did not fit into all this were the ones who are today sometimes called Dalits, treated as untouchables. Whether this system is a question of racism or whether it is Casteism is questions that unnecessarily have detained a lot of academics without any real practical consequence for that. At the Durban Conference of the United Nations on xenophobia and racism, there was a lot of work done trying to make the people who were fighting racism to consider caste as a category of race. They got it wrong. Race is a category of caste. They got it wrong. There was an existing legislation, existing international treaty, and people tried to have it included there out of desperation, trying to say, protect us. Protect us under this category, make the treatment that is meted out to us today, illegal and criminal. So it was a tactic, but it was a mistake. What is caste? Caste is hierarchy. It is something that you inherit. It is a system of dominance. It is a system of subservience and servilience, servitude. It's a system of inequality. As a recent writer on caste wrote, it's the architecture of inequality. It provides the scaffolding on which various injustices can be pegged on. What I've mentioned to you is just a glimpse of what caste does to people. But I brought you to today when I said at the Durban Conference of the United Nations, humanists, rationalists, free thinkers, secularists, human rights activists, and the victims of the caste system, all of them, why were they saying, we don't want this, we want this to be treated as crime? What was happening in the name of caste? is that already over a few thousands of years, the first one recorded to have fought casteism in a silent but powerful way was who we call today the Buddha. The Buddha opened up the gates of his community to people from all backgrounds and all castes. That was an extraordinary thing to do. Also at a time when the discrimination was extreme, whatever the rewriting of history today is being done by those who believe in the caste system and want it around. To say everyone can come into my community and listen to me and talk to me was a very new thing to the time that the Buddha lived in. But 2000 years after, still people were being denied the possibility of, let me tell you, going to school. Already it was a poor, illiterate society. But if you were born in what today, as I said, 
is called Dalit, treated untouchable. Then going to school was not going to be something you would hope to do. Very few did. One of the ones who went to school was Dr. Ambedkar, whose name you hear often. Perhaps less often than one hears of the ones who fought for the rights of the black people in North America. But Dr. Ambedkar's remit, scholarship, and humanism puts him above many of the people who fought for human liberation, freedom, equality, and dignity. Dr. Ambedkar was denied entry into the classroom. He could follow the class from outside the classroom. He studied by street lamps, the light of street lamps, because there was none at home. He was not allowed to drink water along with the others in his class, in his school. Dr. Ambedkar happens to be the principal draftsman, architect of the Indian constitution, which guarantees rights to people. There is progress, but there are challenges. If you're not allowed to go to school, then you're already excluded from society when you're not able to have literacy. Those of you who like Indian literature in English, Dr. Mulkaraj Anand, another humanist, wrote a powerful novel called The Untouchable. The book is one day in the life of an untouchable. In that, there is a powerful passage of where an untouchable person dares to enter a temple and touch the statue of the deity. Life and is... horror in the minds of the rest of the people in society. The awe with which and the fear with which he approaches this. In many villages, temples in India today, the Dalits, the untouchables, are still not allowed entry into a temple. Along with my father-in-law, who is, I mentioned him to say he was the initiator of the activism. We have led people into temples, atheists that we are. We led people into temples in support of their right to the freedom of religion, in recognition of their humanity and their equality with others. It is illegal, but the practice exists. The law does not always change much. 50,000, this is statistics from 2021, 50,000 recorded crimes against people born in the untouchable communities. In the year 2021, that is 10 minutes, every 10 minutes, an atrocity, a crime, a rape, a murder, an insult of various categories is what people from this community are subject to. How many are there? They are about 200 million. About nine times, I guess, the population of Australia. Such is the magnitude of the problem. I must now explain to you that when with Professor Venkat, that is my father-in-law, and I, when we took people into temples, sometimes, we took 
a lower category of the untouchables to a higher category of untouchable temple. Can you now imagine the diabolical nature of this social stratification? where it makes the victim perpetuate the atrocity. So all these are untouchable. Some are at the lowermost, some are not so low. So the lowermost people are not allowed entry into the upper caste of the untouchables. Interdining amongst them is unknown. So. I was initiated, so to say, into this activism after my return from the UK back to India. In the UK, we started the first conference, first humanist international conference, world conference on untouchability at a time when we were campaigning for the UK legislature to outlaw discrimination based on the caste system. Like the Anglican church, which resisted the application of the human rights law to it in the UK, some Hindu associations in the UK were very upset that there might be a law that would outlaw caste discrimination in the United Kingdom. A man called Bhikkhu Parikh, a lord like me, I two years ago bought land in Scotland, a square meter, and now I'm entitled to be called lord as well. And my wife, when you talk to her, you must address her as lady. These comical figures who are academics, professors, intellectuals objected to inclusion of caste discrimination in the equality, uh, equality law. Do you see where the resistance to social reform comes from? Without reason, no social reform can be successful. Now, Dr. Ambedkar, whose name I mentioned to you, he said, when the Hindus leave India, caste becomes a problem for the world. Not the exact words, but that's the sense. I showed to you at the beginning of my talk that it's not a Hindu problem. It's a human disease. It exists in Shinto, Japan. 1970s, all the major technological corporations of Japan were exposed for having a list of burakumin so that they could be excluded from employment by simply looking at their names. All that they did in Japan after that was the honchos came and bowed and said sorry, as they do in Japan. There was no law. There was no punishment. Untouchability, the caste system, the system of extreme inequality that you inherit exists in Buddhist societies, in Burma, in Korea, in Sri Lanka. It exists in Hindu society. It existed in Christian society. It's there still in animist Nigeria. It is still there in Yemen. And because of the influence of the society and history, it's there in Islamic Pakistan. It's there in Islamic Bangladesh. It's there, of course, in Nepal. So Dr. Ambedkar was not entirely right to say it's merely a problem of the Hindus. But it is a fact that people from India, what is today called India, about 
30 million of them from the diaspora of India. Some of them from Fiji Islands are, have been there for many generations. The ones in Suriname and so on have been there for a while. And there's been a lot of recent migration. It might be of interest for you to know that after grandly, piously abolishing slavery in Europe, following the unspeakable horrors of Belgium in Africa. And when the countries of Europe got together, when they were discussing how to cut the cake of Africa, and the church led by the queens and the kings and so on, were all for abolishing slavery. They found the trick of indentured labor and transported by the tens of millions people from India, slaves from India, and dumped them in South Africa. People living in South Africa of Indian origin, those in the Caribbean islands, did not go there on a golden visa or an investment visa or 491 or 190 visas. They went there because they were packed up by the British to do slave work on the sugarcane and other um, enterprises that were giving them money. So these are slaves in their homes too in the choice of their life partners, in their socialization, caste plays an active role. I can tell you none of the dominant castes were transported there. It was the victims of the caste system who were sent there, who still retain it and hang on to it as culture. The conflation of religion and culture is a major problem, also for politicians. I have here a picture of the present prime minister of this country and the former prime minister of this country, draped in the religious attire of the Hindus with all the insignia and om written on it. They sought the support of the Indians in the temples of the Indians, in a country where as many Christians are there are the humanists, in a country where only 3% of the people are actually Hindu. The politicians are so crude and unsophisticated that they go to the places of prayer in an predominantly secular society for support from the immigrant groups. There are 800,000 immigrants from the Indian subcontinent in this country. About 90% of them are Hindu. It does not mean all of them are upper caste, dominant. There was a time when the untouchable could not leave their ghetto, forget the village. There was a time when they could not leave their usual place of residence. Many of them have managed to leave the country. Now, leaving the country is an adventure, whatever your background is. Upper caste, lower caste, doesn't matter. If you leave a poor country and you're seeking opportunity, you're seeking protection, you're seeking release, you're seeking freedom, you're seeking equality, it's a big step. You have endured the monsoon, the summer, the winter, you've endured, you've at least enjoyed the spring of India. You land in Melbourne to experience all of that in one single day. 
it requires courage to hold on to this new weather, new place, a new style of life, and a new cultural system. And when I talk of Indians and the problems in Australia, do not please misunderstand me for saying as if I were saying all of the people who migrated here from India are part of what I'm telling you. No, there are incredible stories of bravery, of personal achievements. I told you of the one born untouchable in India who managed to study, who went to the London School of Economics and Columbia University, and who ended up being the chief draftsperson of the Indian constitution, a fine document, a humanist. I should also tell you about Professor Jagadish Chennupati, right now, the president of the Australian Academy of Sciences. He comes from the land I come from. He too studied by the light of borrowed candles. I had the honor and privilege of interviewing him for over two hours. And he narrated to me the extraordinary story of how he, through the light of borrowed candles, was able to read. He is the world's foremost authority on nanotechnology. He is what I said to you, he is a distinguished professor at, um, at the university, the National University. The struggles and the achievements are of the same order. They don't come from the same caste backgrounds. So, it's not uniquely caste, it is a lack of opportunity and of resource that also should be considered. It is not as if everyone who comes here from an upper caste background is a rich, privileged person. But surely the ones acting like that are the ones from there. That is for sure. 2018, we organized one of the founders is here, Mr. Meghnath of the South Asian Humanist Association in Australia. So I came on a lecture tour in this country and we had the chapter in Melbourne in place the national chapter was to be inaugurated in Sydney at the parliament, and they were humanist, secular, rationalist activists from India who organized it and set up the arrangements for it. One day before the meeting, a call from the parliaments in Sydney saying the meeting is canceled from the parliament's office. So there was panic and the panic led to inquiries and discussions as to why a meeting that was agreed to which a shadow member of the parliament uh, of the ministry there, well, cabinet was coming and so on. Why was this meeting canceled? We made inquiries about you with the Indian High Commission or consulate, and they did not know anything about you. So this was communicated to us. So my question, our question finally was, this is a group of Australians organizing an Australian event and intending to establish an Australian organization call South Asian, why did you call the Indian High Commission? You could have called the local police if you wanted to find out if these were criminals. Why would you call a foreign 
entity to talk about and to give you information about Australians. This is going to be a big scandal now for you that you ask foreign missions to squeal on, to inform on a nonviolent group of people in this country. Secondly, get your geography right. South Asian is Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan, Sri Lanka. Which other missions did you call? And if you did not consult with the other missions, why did you consult only this mission? I'll tell you why and what happened. Before coming, I'm sorry about the PowerPoint, but I can show you this. I hope you can see it. 2018 was this meeting here. 2017, we had launched a cast is cancer campaign in North America, in the United States of America, and also in Canada. We were going to, we were going to invite Prime Minister Trudeau to join hands with us and to undertake a DNA test to defeat the claims, to defeat the claims being made by people that you're in the upper caste because genetically you are superior. You are in the lower caste because you had an inferior genetic makeup. These guys knew what we had done there and they had lobbied with the parliament in New South Wales. Now step back a second and ask yourself, what power these people might be having that they are able to get a meeting in the parliament cancelled without even consulting with the parties that are involved in this. Now, I will tell you something else. You have, in this country, special religious education. In New South Wales, mm. there is special religious education. And I will read out to you Uh. I will read out to you what is in the special religious education material in the schools of New South Wales. It's supposed to be a 45 minute lesson and the lesson plan explains this. Varna system, caste is an easy word to use. Varna, it complicates things and I do not wish to go into the details of that. But Varna system is a Sanskrit word which refers to hypothetical social classes. Hypothetical social classes. Whereby the society was classified in principle 
into four theoretical varna based on occupation and livelihood, which worked in coordination for the benefit of society. So, I, I'm not sure at what point we stopped, but the idea that if you were good in this life, that you would be reborn to a higher level in the caste hierarchy is a promise made by religious belief. What does this mean? This means that you shall seek justice, not anymore in this world, in this life, because it shall be taken care of for you for the next. And that is when you will be rewarded for whatever good or bad that you were doing. Not everyone believes in this. Not every victim of the caste system is Hindu. A lot of victims are Hindu. Some of them have rebelled against it, have questioned, challenged, and thrown rationalist challenges, responses. And that has led to both upheaval and protest. You will now understand why they sought to cancel our meeting at the parliament in New South Wales. But as I told you, our friends in Sydney promised a major national scandal. And the result of that was within an hour or so, the meeting was restored and Saha was launched in Sydney. You need people who will respond. You will need people who will challenge the politicians to not go by the stereotypes of whatever community they are dealing with. I've seen a letter written to the um, Multicultural Commission in this state. The premier invites people for an annual dinner or something, multicultural thing, for the people of Indian diaspora. The food is only vegetarian. Why is that so? The taboos back in India say that the pure people are the ones who shall eat only vegetarian food. And even the words okay. used for non-vegetarian food will be derogatory. And as a result of this, if you were eating non-vegetarian food, you may not be even allowed to rent a home in a housing society. Now, to carry a prejudice against someone's food, and to bring it here and say this is culture, and to then influence the local state's administration. No one's saying don't give vegetarian food. If someone says I need only kosher food, this is a Jewish meeting, why should you not have what people will eat? But would you then make it the complete menu for everyone? Especially when the consumption of meat comes with a kind of derision, exclusion, and even punishment, especially if that meat happens to be beef. Now, to allow this to happen here, I would think is through lack of knowledge about these matters. I have a friend, a humanist, and you should all go to Footscray to eat in Sankranti Indian restaurant because a bunch of hooligans, they call themselves community heads, they went to the restaurant to threaten him not to serve beef. And he said, but why would I not serve beef? Beef is served even in Indian restaurants in India. They said, no, do you think the Indians here will come to your restaurant if you keep serving beef curry? He said, try my beef, it's very tasty. And if you don't want it, I will find others who have the appetite for it. 
he's recounted this story to me that you can bully people because it is not your caste food. Mind you, this is the point. It is not your caste food. You will not allow it to happen. Now, the thing about the caste system is this. If you are born poor, you might grow to be rich. But if you are born a Dalit, you can even become the Chief Justice of the Indian Supreme Court. You can be President of the Republic, but you can never leave your caste. Which means, like happened to a judge in a state in Uttar Pradesh, after this judge was transferred, his tenure was over, he was moved to another position. The successor to this judge got the courtroom cleaned and purified by using water from the holy river Ganges. There are instances, as reported just two months ago, from the state of Karnataka, whose capital Bangalore is the high-tech capital of the country. Mm in that state, it's a big state, in a village, because a woman dared to access the common resource of the village, water, because she touched the tap and collected the water, they purified the tank using the excreta of a cow to purify a place defiled by a human, using the excreta of an animal. Yes, they've been arrested. You should not always look at this as a problem with the government. The problem is so gigantic. I said to you, the number of people born untouchable is nine times the population of this country, of this continent. So it's nothing that you can simply change. An illiterate country, which has now from a very poor level of literacy has come to 70%. Now, it's a big struggle for things to happen. When you come to any country outside India, outside Pakistan, outside Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, or Sri Lanka, not only do you bring your favorite foods, you also pack your caste with you. Is this Australia's problem? There are, as I said to you, nearly, not exactly so many, but nearly 800,000 people of Indian origin in this country. The largest section of people seeking permanent residency in this country is from India. And there are so many Indians who are really talented, hardworking, and take the greatest advantage of the opportunities given to them. But what happened in the US is that Google, headed by a South Indian, not of the oppressed caste, organized a lecture on caste discrimination in the diaspora in North America. That lecture was canceled. Google canceled the lecture. I don't know if they will prevent the search items to come up as well, but they canceled the lecture. Not too long ago, Cisco had a case filed against them by the California state for discrimination of people. There was a complaint, it was investigated into, and a case filed. Equality Labs, which is led by Tenmori Sandar Rajan, who was there at an international conference that we organized on humanism in San Francisco, 
she reports that nearly 250 phone calls came to a phone helpline they started for Equality Labs from people who said they are victims of discrimination, derisory treatment, insult, and so on. Not this I say it with full knowledge of how things are. Not every time there is a complaint will it be legitimate. But the way to handle it is through a proper process of investigation, verification, and then punishing those who are doing wrong. The United States has now embarked on a process where this seems more feasible than it seems to be the case in the United Kingdom. In Canada, the Education Board in Montreal agreed that caste should be a protected category. Seattle, the first city in North America, in fact, to outlaw caste discrimination, has set an example for the rest of the people in, in the world. The Australian Human Rights Commission has said not too long ago that caste discrimination is a form of racism. As I said to you, we should turn it around. Racism is a part of caste as a hierarchy of discrimination, of dehumanization that comes to you through hereditary um, consequences. And in the report of the Australian Human Rights Commission, casteism is a form of social stratification found across South Asian cultures and religious communities and carried into other nations through diasporic movement. There are, I believe, a hundred temples in New South Wales, a hundred Hindu temples. What could be the reason that all the temples in New South Wales have a priest who is born only in one caste? Remember, you are born a Dalit, you will die one. You are born poor, you can become rich. You can never become a priest in a temple with certain exceptions, which are historical in reason. Not because of the religious doctrine, but because of some historical practices. In Adelaide, South Australia, there have been complaints, I think by a Bhutanese uh, immigrant. He said his mother-in-law, 84 years old, he wanted to perform a ceremony for her. After his full name was known, because your family name, very often, of caste um, um, attribute also part of your appellation, indicates or gives away your your status in the society. So they found out the full name. Suddenly the priest became very busy. They could not come on that day. And one of them confessed to him that I would never do this for you. Now, the funny thing is this man, this Bhutanese uh, immigrant retired from a high position in government. He was told and he was not untouchable. He was not Dalit, according to the castes. It is because he allowed the untouchables to come freely into his house, that his house became impure. Therefore, he should not be allowed in. Now, the police were contacted. The police did think that existing law, with some interpretation, can be used to cover this, but it's not clear. A proper, a clear law which talks of what could be a major problem in one of the biggest immigrant populations in this country, 
to be recognized. People in the first wave and the second wave and so on who came here were clearly those from the privileged classes in India. And that would be also the castes, the upper dominant caste. That could be a reason why most of your top governmental state recognition awards given to Indians are all of people who come from those caste categories. Has there been a Dalit? Has there been um, a person from a subjugated caste? Also in the honors list of the United Kingdom or of Australia or of New Zealand is something for academics to research. I know the answer, but research would be giving the right uh, support for what I believe is the case. Housing. Apart from the fact that there is a housing crisis in the country, if you belong to a lower caste, lower, I should make it clearer, lower the caste, subjugated caste, dominated caste, discriminated caste, easily identified by your name. And if you were to rent from a upper dominant, dominating caste member, you're very likely not to be allowed to rent. So what are the rental laws in this country doing to protect them? It's a new situation. Do, they, do the laws in this country protect Aboriginal people? Uh, by extension, they are also from India. 50,000 years ago, after a sojourn, um, they came here. So either those Indians or these Indians, what are the laws that protect them? How do you make sure that the dignity of the individual, of the person, and the diversity of the immigrant population is at the same time recognized by those who are in power, those who are able to make a difference. I read out to you what is read um, and said in the special religious, religious education uh, teaching plan as something that is of benefit to society. I would think a response to that would be to teach people in this country, and I don't mean simply people of Indian origin, the great stories of emancipation of societies subjugated, dehumanized for thousands of years. How a few individuals on the basis of universal principles have been able to drag an entire people above where they were, not where they should be yet, but where they were. 